It's been said that better questions lead us naturally to better answers, and that it's in not knowing that we open the doorway to knowing. I'm Scott Lennox, and you're listening to The Beautiful Question, a consideration of things that truly matter in a complex world. So just how relevant are joy and delight to the ways we live our lives? I'll make a strong and substantial case that they're not negotiable and that they are altogether necessary. Stay with me this week as we consider ways of searching for joy and delight and cultivating the habit of taking them into our lives and keeping them there. This week I'll start with a few definitions just for the sake of clarity. In his book of collected poems, Dancing with Joy, Roger Housden calls joy an upwelling of life, of spirit, a blossoming of freedom, referring to it as wholehearted, full-bodied, and all-encompassing. Closely related to that, the word delight is defined by Merriam-Webster as a high degree of gratification or pleasure, and as the experience of taking great pleasure in what we're doing. And finally, the word cultivate. It has at least two meanings. One has to do with preparing the soil for planting. The other has to do with acquiring or developing something like habits of gratitude or happiness or joyfulness. With these definitions in mind, at least two initial questions arise. One, could it be that cultivating experiences of joy and delight are significantly more important to us than we previously imagined? And two, is it possible that they change us for the better from the inside out? Clinical studies demonstrate that being joyful boosts the immune system, has directly positive effects on the cardiovascular and nervous systems, improves resilience, strengthens our ability to cope with stress, and even promotes longevity. And so if only from a scientific or a medical point of view, joy and delight are necessary if we want to do more than just get by. They are two of the built-in passports to living well and to having a sense of meaning and purpose. I feel obligated to acknowledge to you that my thoughts about this consideration have been intensified by the recent loss of several good friends. Last week, one of them was taken off life support. She'll be profoundly missed by everyone who knew her. Not long after visiting her hospital room, I told a mutual friend that being aware of the fact that each of us is going to die makes me lean even more intensely into joy and delight. Years ago, when I acknowledged with raw clarity that my life will one day end, every aspect of how I live it changed and intensified, every single one. Knowing that I won't be here forever, I don't want to take anything or anyone for granted, including myself. As Steven Tyler sang it with the band Aerosmith, I don't want to miss a thing. For as long as I have the privilege of being alive, I choose to be actively and intentionally engaged, living at the highest possible level that I can, moment by moment. Joy and delight are essential parts of that. In the past, I've enjoyed many things, large and small, but never more consciously than I do now. The irreversible tectonic shift in my thinking and in my behavior was set into motion almost 20 years ago by my surgeon in the recovery room. His two-word statement, it's cancer, changed everything about my engagement with life. Quite naturally, my first reaction was one of sorrow. But as my grief passed and my life continued to go on, I began to notice intuitively that I would feel better and that it would be much more useful for me to identify everything I could that was positive and boldly lean into it, whatever it was. It was time to be more intentional about attending to feelings of joy and to everything I could find that delights me. That decision 
began an active search for what is joyful and delightful, no matter how insignificant they might seem. As I began noticing joyful things and small delights, I could feel them lightening my heart and clearing my mind. I could feel them enlivening me. So within a few weeks of my surgeon telling me what he did, I became more intentional, more ferocious, more direct, more playful, more gentle and loving, more consciously attuned, and more tenderly appreciative of even the tiniest things. I think of the phrase often attributed to the German architect Mies van der Rohe, that God is in the details. One of the things I take away from that is the way many small things can amass to something fine and beautiful and good, especially when we're intentional about it. For months after my medical treatments, I could barely swallow. Solid food would be out of the question for almost two years. As preposterous as it seems, it was during that time that I brought out all the recipes I've been collecting for decades and created my first cookbook. I know, that sounds kind of unbelievable. I couldn't eat, but I was making a cookbook. I couldn't swallow the dishes I was writing about, but I was mentally savoring every ingredient, sometimes closing my eyes and imagining their flavor and texture and color and aroma. I found delight in imagining every finished preparation and how beautiful it would look when I could finally plate it and serve it. Two years later, when I was finally able to eat again, it was with a focus and a passion and a sense of joy that had no equal in my history. In my search for the delightful, I had taken myself to a heightened level of joyful engagement, a practice that continues to grow not just about food, but with everything. And so against that backdrop, today I present you with four beautiful questions. What does it mean for you to actively search for joy and everyday delights? Where have you already found them in the past and where might you find them now? What must you do to stop and truly notice them and drink them in? And finally, in what ways might you cultivate the habit of intentionally bringing joy and delight into your life? I'll go over those questions again in a minute, but notice this. As with so many other things, the shift I'm proposing begins with a decision that is then followed by definitive action. The decision on its own is not enough. But here's a piece of great news about that. Noticing joy and delight is actually easy, quite easy, because the ability is built into us. When we were really small, we didn't have to think about it or work at it at all. It was natural for things to delight us and for us to respond joyfully. We were delighted with our own fingers and toes and with the array of sounds our voice could make. The slightest breeze across our face made us smile. The sound of birds singing joyfully caught our attention. The taste of something delicious widened our eyes and left us wanting more. Acts of affection soothed and comforted us. Music touched us and joyfully moved us long before we had the language we would need to describe it. Certain colors and movements held us delightfully spellbound. Each comforting touch spoke directly to something deep within us, and we were quick to smile and laugh and move in response with it. We didn't try. It just happened. In that altogether natural state, we were life's perfect audience and life's perfect dance partner. How marvelous it is to know that such joyful enthusiasm and awareness are still resident in each of us. Regardless of what we've been through or what we've experienced, regardless of what we've been telling ourselves to the contrary, regardless of how hard we struggle, the ability to experience joy and delight remains natural and built into us. 
This week, I'm hoping that my beautiful questions will make your decision to actively cultivate joy and delight much easier. Let's give those questions a second look. First, what does it mean to you to actively search for joy and everyday delights? Asking that another way, as your life is right now, what would it look like, what would it feel like to search out what is joyful and delightful? Question two, where have you already found them and where might you find them now? Stated another way, in obvious and not so obvious places, where might joy and delight be found right this moment? Question three, what must you do to stop and truly notice them and drink them in? I'll ask it another way. What simple shifts of habit and intention will help you find them and take them into yourself? And finally, in what ways might you cultivate the habit of intentionally bringing them into your life and dancing with them? Let me look at this last question a little more closely. What must you change in your thinking or behavior to actively cultivate the daily habit of finding joy and delight and then savoring your experience with them? I'm willing to bet that if this has been a low priority for you and you bring it to the foreground of your life, you'll soon be joyfully writing to tell me about it. It would delight me to hear what happens. As I say each week, my light with your light. Thank you again for listening. I'm always inspired by our collaboration as we work and play together, building better lives and better possibilities for ourselves, for one another, for the world, and for our beautiful planet home. I look forward to your comments and to your feedback. You can also be inspired by visiting my good friends at Cosmos Journal, including their online newsletter. That's K-O-S-M-O-S Journal. Their mission is to inform, inspire, and engage global transformation in harmony with all life. You can easily find them online at cosmosjournal.org. And as always, you can find my free podcasts and guided relaxation audios by searching for The Beautiful Question in Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud or CastBox or by visiting the podcast page of my website at scottlennox.com. If you find them useful or encouraging, don't hesitate to share them. I'm Scott Lennox, and this has been The Beautiful Question. The Beautiful Question is a One Light production, written, recorded, and produced by Scott Lennox at Heart Rock Studios in Fort Worth, Texas, as a way of paying forward to life, being fully present, and becoming better engaged with things that truly matter in a complex world.